His left arm was the worst. The dragon flame had burned so hot that the king's armour had melted into his flesh. A body believed to be Rhaenys Targaryen was later found beside the carcass of her dragon, but it was so blackened that no one could be sure it was her. Beloved daughter of Lady Jocelyn Baratheon and Prince Aemon Targaryen, faithful wife to Lord Corlys Valerian, mother and grandmother, the queen who never was lived fearlessly and died amidst blood and fire. She was 55 years old. 800 knights and squires and common men lost their lives that day as well. Another hundred perished not long after when Prince Aemond and Sir Criston Cole took Rook's rest and put its garrison to death. Lord Staunton's head was carried back to King's Landing and mounted above the old gate, but it was the head of the dragon Maelies, drawn through the city on a cart, that awed the crowds of small folk into silence. Septon Eustace tells us that thousands left King's Landing afterward until the Dowager Queen Alessant ordered the city gates closed and barred. King Aegon II did not die, though his burns brought him such pain that some say he prayed for death. Carried back to King's Landing in a closed litter to hide the extent of his injuries, his grace did not rise from his bed for the rest of the year. Septons prayed for him, maesters attended him with potions and milk of the poppy. But Aegon slept nine hours out of every ten, waking only long enough to take some meagre nourishment before he slept again. It was a win for the Greens, but the fallout from Rook's Rest was significant for both sides. When word reached Dragonstone and the Black Council, Lord Corlys Valerian, husband to Princess Rhaenys, openly berated the Queen for staying home while his wife was sent into a trap to die. A case could be made that Rhaenyra nearly won the war through Rhaenys' sacrifice and the near slaying of Aegon. Now it threatened to deprive the Queen and her family of their most important ally. The Greens would not have given up had Aegon II been killed, but if he had... Let's not forget blood and cheese. As if we could. Maelor Targaryen, the two-year-old princeling who saw his older brother beheaded in front of him, is the Green's heir at this point in the timeline. One thing we've learned from A Song of Ice and Fire and A Song of Ice and Fire history, as well as real history, is that child kings and lords can be a very risky bet. Though this was a vicious and brutal battle, many lords and ladies had not yet fully committed to either blacks or greens. Surely some must have weighed the idea that Aegon would not survive his injuries, and we can't argue with that concern. His wounds were quite gruesome. The notion of a two-year king alone would cause many of those undecideds or those wanting to be on the winning side to favor the blacks. Some may have taken the side of a man over a woman, but those same people might not take the side of a boy over a woman. Neither Aegon nor his dragon would play much of a role going forward in terms of armies and battles, given their wounds, so both sides were effectively down a dragon and dragon rider, and while Maelys had been a more dangerous dragon than Sunfire, Aegon was the Green's crowned king. There were lots of battles to win and lots of castles to take, so losing your king during the first is a terrible exchange especially if we account for the potential lost support from other houses who hadn't taken sides yet. Even worse if it sends that potential support to the blacks. So it was important for the Greens to continue to show strength in the field. Though Rook's Rest was a Pyrrhic victory, it was a victory, and Melis's head was a powerful symbol of that victory. As we heard in the opening quote there, the small folk of King's Landing were awed to silence when they saw it. It would be the job of Larry Strong and the rest of the Greens' leadership to not allow any rumors of Aegon's death to start or spread. A difficult task, since they could not let him show himself. 
It was time for other Greens to step forward into leadership roles to show that the loss of Aegon and Sunfire could be borne. The typical choice was made then. You must rule the realm now until your brother is strong enough to take the crown again, the king's hand told Prince Aemond. Nor did Sir Criston need to say it twice, writes Eustace. And so, one-eyed Aemond the Kinslayer took up the iron and ruby crown of Aegon the Conqueror. It looks better on me than it ever did on him, the prince proclaimed. Yet, Aemond did not assume the style of king, but named himself only Protector of the Realm and Prince Regent. The typical choice was... Pretty bad. Aemond will have a huge impact on the realm, but protection is not the word we would choose to describe what he brought to the table. What did we just say about child kings? Well, Aemond was 19 or 20, not a child by Westerosi standards by any means, but he was very much prone to acting like one. In an effort to show that the family had things under control, regardless of whether it was Aegon II or a two-year-old on the throne, they gave ultimate responsibility to someone who was unable to control himself. But really, they did what all Westerosi families do. They gave responsibilities to the eldest male with martial tendencies. This one happened to have the largest dragon, too, Vagar. While the dance is surely a stab at the deep flaws of monarchy, George gives a major critique of the brand of nepotism common to the nobility here as well. It isn't just kings and queens that ruin things, it's their families and extended families too. That applies to all walks of life where power and wealth reside, not just where there are crowns in the balance. We will repeatedly see both the blacks and greens squander opportunities and lives and resources by making disastrous choices with regards to leadership decisions, especially when it comes to naming new leaders. Starting with Aemond One-Eye, this episode will see a lot of the wrong people invested with power and responsibility sit back and enjoy while they waste it all. Many and more of them aren't good at what they do, but they do make it interesting. Hello and welcome to the third installment of our Dance of the Dragons series. As Aziz and Lady Gwyn have said, in this episode we'll see more of everything that's come before. More dragons, more deaths, more destruction, and more bad decision making. Both sides will suffer losses, though neither will gain much. One thing the process of creating this series together has done is give us all an ever greater appreciation of the complexity of George's world building. We have much more to come for you on this topic in the future, but for now, we hope you enjoy this foray into what is essentially a season of battles for House Targaryen. Before we begin, though, we'll take a moment, as ever, to thank some of our patrons. Thanks to Flaming Lightbringer patron TJ Harrington, Dragon Steel patron Peter, Pale as Milk Glass patrons Daniel, Joel I, first of his name, Kelly, Laura, Sister Winter, Pepper, Maltude, and John Wergarian. And thanks as well to the History of Westeros First Sword, Jeff Gnarly the Long Snapper, Dragon Rider Talenis the Talon, King of Gagossos, Rider of Talarius, a red dragon with scales, horns, and talons of midnight black, and Hunter of House Black Cloud, the Storm Runner, King of the Sky, Rider of Hurricaneicon, the Windworm, a dragon with scales of brilliant platinum silver, horns, claws, and fangs of pure white, with eyes the color of diamonds of fire. Pyrrhic Victory. In each of the first two episodes, we took a moment early on for a real-world historical anecdote with a heavy relevance to some aspect of the Dance of the Dragons. Since we've just mentioned the concept of a Pyrrhic victory, and we'll do again a few times in this episode because it's ever so fitting, the term deserves an explanation. Pyrrhus was a very high-born Greek son to the king of Epirus, but his father died when he was young and he was driven into exile. His crown and birthright taken from him by another house. Sounds familiar. This was during the era of the Wars of the Diadochi, the succession struggles that followed the death of Alexander the Great. Pyrrhus himself was a second cousin once removed to Alexander. Greek tradition often held that a series of games should accompany the death of an important figure, and the death of Alexander was followed by what was basically a huge metaphorical series of funeral games. A historical fiction novel based on these wars was written by the excellent author Mary Renault, appropriately entitled Funeral Games, 
with shifting alliances, intrigue, lots of crowns in the balance, and a ridiculous number of battles fought over Alexander's short-lived conquests, the wars of the Diadochi were very much a funeral Game of Thrones. And even though Pyrrhus was born during these civil wars, they lasted so long that he eventually fought in them. They were still raging when he came of age. He was at the Great Battle of Ipsus in 301 BC, where two armies, individually larger than any ever assembled in Westeros, faced off. Included were perhaps over a thousand elephants, though no dragons whatsoever. Many of Alexander's former generals, now kings, had joined their strength to fight against the mighty Antigonus One-Eye, who had emerged amidst these wars as the most powerful, and his growing strength threatened to overwhelm them all. No mention of him placing a gemstone, sapphire, or otherwise in place of his missing eye, but I think it'd be cooler if he did. The stakes were seen as thus. If the allies won, they would each keep their respective crowns and return to a state of affairs that featured warring smaller kingdoms. If Antigonus were to win, he could reform most of Alexander's huge empire. Pyrrhus, 18 years old at the time, fought under Antigonus's heir, a formidable man with the excellent name of Demetrius the Besieger. Demetrius was in charge of his father's cavalry and led a successful assault on the enemy cavalry, driving them from the battlefield. Pyrrhus was a subcommander despite his age and fought extremely well. The plan, it seems, was to then wheel about and assault the enemy infantry from behind, but elephants under Seleucus, one of the allied kings, were apparently deployed in a manner that prevented Demetrius's cavalry from returning to the main battle area. Recall that even in A Song of Ice and Fire, we learn that horses hate the smell of elephants, and here that proved decisive. With his own cavalry held at bay, Antigonus soon enough found his position threatened, his bodyguards pressed, several dying in his defense. History tells us he stubbornly and bravely held out, believing his son would return and turn the tide. To be fair, he had never lost a battle before, but there's a first time for everything, and the 81-year-old, one-eyed, giant king was pierced repeatedly by javelins until he fell. And with his death, the battle was over. It appears that Demetrius, in accomplishing an important objective on the battlefield, allowed the enemy to accomplish an even more important objective. It's not worth beating your worst enemy if it costs your king's life. He took their most valuable military asset too far away for it to be of use at the most crucial moment of the battle. But the Battle of Ipsus was itself not a Pyrrhic victory, of course. For Pyrrhus, it wasn't even a victory. Despite the loss, Demetrius the besieger survived and continued his martial career that certainly included besieging more cities. He was extremely impressed by Pyrrhus' skills as both leader and warrior and supposedly claimed he'd be the greatest general of his age if he lived. Whether or not Demetrius really said that about Pyrrhus, it did seemingly turn out to be true, and historians maintain that about him to this day. For a time, Pyrrhus helped Demetrius attempt to rebuild his father's empire and the power of the House of Antigonus, but in that, they were unsuccessful. As a result, he was eventually given up for hostage as part of a peace treaty. His captor, Ptolemy I Soter, whose armies fought against Antigonus One-Eye and Demetrius the Besieger at Ipsus and elsewhere, decided it would be to his advantage to put this outstanding former enemy commander Pyrrhus back on the throne of Epirus as a check against his rivals in Greece. So, after marrying Ptolemy's stepdaughter, Pyrrhus took an army and quickly took back the throne of Epirus, a kingdom in western Greece, just across the sea from the heel of the boot of Italy. And after a series of wars and campaigns to the east that included fighting against Demetrius the besieger, Pyrrhus eventually looked west. He became embroiled in a campaign against Rome, appropriately called the Pyrrhic Wars, and it was during this campaign that the term Pyrrhic victory originated. At the Battle of Asculum in 279 AD, Pyrrhus was victorious but lost many men in the process. Further battles saw further victories, but the Romans simply kept replacing their losses with new recruits of similar quality while Pyrrhus was increasingly unable to do so despite taking considerably fewer losses. He supposedly said, if we are victorious in one more battle with the Romans, we shall be utterly ruined. There you have it. The Pyrrhic victory, a win where the value of that victory is exceeded by its cost. 
A win is empty if you can do nothing with it, though still it is better than losing and dying. Not just these wars against Rome, though. His entire career could be judged similarly. He was a large man, a great warrior and battle commander who genuinely seemed to enjoy war and combat. But he was an unwise king known for overexerting his men and resources and the kingdoms he ruled. In that, he reminds us of Robert Baratheon. But he was also a lot like Robert's currently featured distant ancestor, Daemon Targaryen. Restless, always seeking fresh conquests, and picking fights with enemies more powerful than himself that he often won anyways. He was of the house of Aeacus, which claimed descent from Achilles, and thus Zeus and other deities in addition to the aforementioned Alexander the Great, whose own heritage boasted similar blood connections to gods and heroes. In a world where lineage is important, the blood of the gods is a similar concept enough to the blood of the dragon. And the blood of the dragon will be of particular importance in this episode. And what's blood without fire? Well, appropriately, the name Pyrrhus means red as in flame-colored, like the red dragon of House Targaryen that the blacks and greens are fighting over. How colorful. His name is related to the Greek word pyr, pyre, as in fire giving us terms like pyromaniac or funeral pyre. And what's more Targaryen than a funeral pyre? Well, how about roasting your enemies? Hmm? Never fear, in the Dance of the Dragons, there's plenty of both. Bear the grudge and a crown. Contemptuous of his half-sister Rhaenyra, Aemond One-Eye saw a greater threat in his uncle Prince Daemon and the great host he had gathered at Harrenhal. Summoning his bannermen in council, the prince announced his intent to bring the battle to his uncle and chastise the rebellious riverlords. He proposed to strike the riverlands from both east and west and thus force the lords of the trident to fight on two fronts at once. Jason Lannister had assembled a formidable host in the western hills, a thousand armored knights and seven times as many archers and men-at-arms. Let him descend from the high ground and cross the Red Fork with fire and sword while Sir Criston Cole marched forth from King's Landing, accompanied by Prince Aemond himself on Vagar. The two armies would converge on Harrenhal to crush the traitors of the Trident between them. And if his uncle emerged from behind the castle walls to oppose them, as he surely must, Vagar would overcome Caraxes and Prince Aemond would return to the city with Prince Damon's head. From his warped perspective, a man like Prince Aemon looks at Damon and thinks to himself, I can kill him. He likely thought that about everyone, though, and his thought process somewhat stops there. But he particularly hated his uncle. That said, if it comes down to dragons, well... Aemon's now been in two dragon dances, taken two dragon heads, and emerged unharmed. No one else had done that, not even Damon. And he knows his drag is the largest, so this likely made him even more confident than he already was. Overconfidence and pride and a lack of experience are not exactly a great combination, though, huh? This is not to say that Aemond isn't dangerous. Of course, he's extremely dangerous. He's got that kind of confidence that comes from a complete inability to process danger to himself. He takes risks not because of bravery, although he is also brave, but because he cannot comprehend losing. Basically, there was something not quite right with that boy. Eamon did have at least one thing somewhat right, however, when he said, The danger is my uncle. Ironically, his plan would be the opposite of what we'll see from said uncle. While Damon practiced avoidance, Eamon sought a confrontation. This is an example of clearly not seeing the danger to himself, despite what he just saw happen to his brother and aunt at Rook's Rest. Though dragons tore each other apart... He saw that and wanted more. As the quote says, he also surmised that slaying Damon would cripple support for the blacks, another good sign of his bad judgment. While Damon's leadership and dragon riderdom was indeed incredibly valuable, and while we'd agree he was the most dangerous of the black faction, he was still a controversial figure, very unpopular in a lot of circles. Recall that fear of his influence over Queen Rhaenyra was an oft-cited factor in the rebellion in the first place. There was concern over his leadership style, his personality, and over the notion that he'd push Rhaenyra to kill off her brothers to safeguard her claim. So we think it's more accurate to say his loss would be significant, but it would hardly end the war or cripple the blacks. 
While Amond focused on removing a single piece from the board, no doubt his grandfather, Sir Otto Hightower, still at King's Landing, but no longer hand to the king, had some input, though it was probably ignored. He may have appreciated the focus on Prince Damon, as Sir Otto loathed the man, pray recall, but he may have also been more pragmatic, realizing it was not enough that focusing on him alone was not an ideal strategy. Damon aside, in general, he would confidently guess that Sir Otto did not approve of how his grandson and replacement, Sir Criston, were handling things. After all, from Otto's perspective, things were fine when he was in charge. The Greens just needed to be patient. After his removal, it only took them one battle to nearly get the king and his dragon killed. And for what? Rook's Rest? Do you recall Rook's Rest being important in any other war? Can't think of it? You're not forgetting. It's simply never happened. Rook's Rest is memorable purely because of this one battle and the fallout afterwards. It's barely in A Song of Ice and Fire, nor mentioned in any other civil war or... Much at all, really. By letting these younger, aggressive men take charge, well, mistakes like this are made. Left unchecked, that lack of patience would continue to help the other side. We say letting, as if Serato had much of a choice. Though he had lost his office and didn't seem to have his grandson's ear at all, Sir Otto surely had hope. His family was powerful, still held many advantages, and quite a few allies. As for leadership, well, perhaps they'd learn a few lessons from Rook's Rest. And since the letters he'd wrote and orders he sent out prior to his removal were all still valid, he could expect that they'd start to show results. And indeed they would, very soon. That might get him back in good graces. Notably, we don't hear from any of the other small council members at this time. Eamon seemingly only listened to Cole, and that only part of the time. The Kinslayer and the Kingmaker planned to head back out into the field shortly, intent on slaying the enemy king and his dragon, removing them from the board. They were eager to get going, and would march as soon as the army was assembled and orders were dispatched to other loyal lords elsewhere in the kingdom. The plan, however, involved taking almost all the soldiers in the city, with no battle-ready dragons to be left behind for defense either. So we can easily imagine what Sir Otto and the council might have been saying into the deaf ears of Prince Amund and Kristen Cole. Trading places, prince for prince. Meanwhile at Harrenhal, Damon remained well informed of what was going on at King's Landing. Lady Mizaria, the White Worm, is not unlikely to be a main source, if not the main source. Recall the earlier strategic discussions the Blacks had that even the aggressive Prince Damon urged caution in the matter of dragon versus dragon. Rook's rest seems to have proven that Prince Damon was correct. Vagar thus remained a huge challenge, quite literally. Though the Blacks had more dragons, the sheer size of Vagar made any kind of direct challenge deadly and uncertain, as Damon well knew. You could say Prince Damon was of the opinion that taking on Vagar and Amund would be a suicide mission. And with the Blacks ultimately unwilling and perhaps unable to face her, Damon's strategy will include a bit of avoidance. Attack where Vagar isn't, and don't get in her way. It makes sense. Why face their most dangerous threat by far, head on, if you don't have to? Damon perhaps believed the war could be won without ever facing Vagar directly, or at least by delaying it until other key objectives could be achieved. Because so much depended on where certain pieces were on the board, we see even more how this is like a chess game of thrones. Damon was probably happy that they put Amond in charge, knowing he's both not bright and over-aggressive. He knew how to take advantage of that. Think of Stannis, pleased at the news that Hostine Frey, whom he dubbed Sir Stupid, was placed in charge of the Frey forces. Stupid leaders can be easily misled or misdirected. And you certainly don't expect them to outthink you. This is not Tywin guessing wrongly that Rob would be rash, because all young boys are rash. Daemon knew Aemon would make rash decisions because they're family. He saw that kid grow up. His knowledge of him is firsthand. So was the knowledge coming through his spy network, as he apparently learned of the Greens' march about as soon as it happened. So with the news that Vagar and Amond and Cole were on the march to Harrenhal, they abandoned it in clever fashion. 
As the quote told us, Aemon's goal was to trap the river lords between them. As he approached from the east, the army under Jason Lannister would come from the west. But instead, the army of river lords marched toward the west to meet the Westerlords before they could join forces with Cole and the prince with the sapphire eye and the largest dragon in Westeros. Damon would not be with the river lords, though. Rather, his plan was to swing wide around the direct route that Aemon was taking from King's Landing. Just himself and Caraxes headed for King's Landing, just a man and his dragon. However, he did send out a murder of ravens from Harrenhal before his departure, in addition to any orders he gave the river lords. Clearly, he had other plans. Harrenhal was given up by the blacks, though the strong still held it. They had no defense against Vagar. So in a short span of days, Prince Damon and Prince Aemond would be trading places. But while Aemond was staying with the army and thus moving at their pace, Damon separated from the river lords. It is said the Green Army took 19 days to reach Harrenhal. A straight shot on Dragonback would be considerably faster, perhaps only a single day. But as we're told, he took a circuitous route to avoid bumping into Aemond. Still, this would only be a few days total. Regardless of the exact number, the point is, Damon got to King's Landing well before Aemond and Cole got to Harrenhal, and that would prove to be crucial. And learn to fly again. While King Aegon had been brought by litter back to his bed in King's Landing to begin his long recuperation after Rook's rest, his dragon, Sunfire the Golden, needed more of the same, but there are a dearth of good transportation options for a wounded dragon. In fact, there isn't much that can be done at all with a wounded dragon, except feed it and hope for the best. To that end, when Kristen Cole left a garrison at Rook's rest, he also left a small contingent of guards for the dragon— whose duties mostly consisted of keeping away trespassers and providing him with sheep for nourishment. Given the garrison was small and the number of men assigned to the dragon also small, this was a golden opportunity. Lord Wallace Mooton led a force out of Maidenpool to join with crabs and brunes from Karak Claw Point and Celtigars from Claw Isle to retake the castle of Rook's Rest. While Lord Mooton's men were able to easily retake it, it soon became clear what their true objective was. Lord Mooton and a cohort of his bravest men headed into the Field of Ashes, where the dragon had lain since the fierce battle in which he was wounded with the objective of destroying Sunfire once and for all. It's worth considering whether this mission was part of Prince Damon's plan that was put into action from Harrenhal via that murder of ravens he sent when he received word that Aemon was marching. It was likely known that Sunfire's wing had been damaged in the battle with Melis, and it would soon become clear that Lord Mooton expected to find a dragon that was close to death. Even so, Damon was a canny commander and experienced with dragons. If retaking Rook's Rest was Damon's plan, we're skeptical that he had knights on horseback sent to slay a wounded dragon. As it happened, when Lord Mooton and his men came upon the dragon, it was sleeping, surrounded by the bones of countless sheep. The sounds of the conflict between his guards and Lord Mooton's men soon roused him, though, and then it became obvious that even a dragon who cannot fly is a formidable opponent. It was reminiscent of the silver-scaled Meraxes at the Battle of the Last Storm, which saw the end of the Durandans. She had been unable to fly or use her flames effectively due to lashing rain, but she slew many knights with tail and claw and fang. It was similar in this case. The attackers faced the dragon bravely, despite him felling several in the same manner as Meraxes, and dealt Sunfire many new wounds with sword and axe and spear. But in this case, there was no rain to dampen his fire, and few shields or weapons can withstand dragon flame. Sixty men were slain by the enraged dragon before the survivors retreated, among them Lord Wallace Mooton. When Lord Mooton's brother found the remains of the fallen two weeks later, there was no sign of sunfire. From the lack of tracks on the ground, it would appear that the dragon had somehow taken flight, in spite of his injured wing. None could say where he flew off to, but perhaps more should have been done to determine sunfire's whereabouts at the time. Hindsight, as they say, is a wonderful thing. On the other hand, a credible tale is told in the histories that Sunfire headed for the deep bogs and pine forests of Crackclaw Point, a place we see firsthand via Brienne's POV. This excerpt might back that tale up a bit. Sheer walls of rock, eaten away by centuries of wind and spray, 
hemmed them in to either side. In some places, they had assumed fantastic shapes. Nimble Dick pointed out a few as they climbed. There's an ogre head, see, he said, and Bren smiled when she saw it. And that there's a stone dragon. T'other wing fell off when my father was a boy. A dragon with a missing wing in the area where Sunfire of the Broken Wing supposedly hid for a while? That looks like a pretty good fit. It might seem difficult to imagine that a dragon, especially one referred to as the most beautiful ever seen, could hide out without being noticed. But again, we turn to Brienne's POV. Here are a few snippets. Brienne prodded her mare through the green gloom, weaving in and out amongst the trees. It would be very easy to get lost here, she realized. Every way she looked appeared the same. By herself, she was not even certain she could have found the sea again. Day or night, the sky was solid gray and overcast, with neither sun nor stars to help her find her way. The eerie stillness grated on her more with every passing hour. It's bad here, Podrick said. This is a bad place. The next day was the same. They rode through pines and bogs, under dark skies and intermittent rain, past sinkholes and caves, and the ruins of ancient strongholds whose stones were blanketed in moss. Frankly, that sounds like a great place for a dragon to hide out for a while, and even a particularly shiny golden dragon could go unnoticed in such an environment. We hear that recovery from a broken wing goes best when you eat a diet rich in squishers, and maybe even the occasional questing knight. We say that because another tale from the histories suggests Sunfire was the target of famous failure Sir Byron Swan, who also appears in Tyrion's chapters as a sly reference. This is the knight who attempted to mimic the legend of Serwin of the Mirror Shield, the man who approached the dragon Urax with a shield polished well enough so as to fool the dragon into thinking it was seeing itself or maybe another dragon. Serwin was successful, Sir Byron was not. There are several versions of the tale of Sir Byron, each version suggesting a different dragon as his target. Cyrax and Vagar are named as well. The possibility that it was Sunfire isn't raised in Tyrion's chapter, but it is raised by Septon Eustace. His claim is dismissed in Fire and Blood because no one knew where Sunfire was. But how could they possibly know that? The locals are sparse, but it's certainly plausible that a few of them knew where the dragon was. I don't see how Sir Byron could have approached Sunfire while the Greens had a cordon of guards around him. So I think if this happened, it was after Sunfire fled into the more remote regions of Crackclaw Point. Now, if Nimble Dick could take Brienne all the way through the area to the Whispers to find where some smugglers were hiding out, why not a similar situation where someone knew where this dragon was hiding while on the mend? March of the Blue Queen just as Rhaenyra quarreled with but maintained the support of primary vassal and in-laws House Valerian, the Greens had quarreled with the High Towers, their in-laws and primary supporter. But the Valerians are close to the center of the action, while Old Town and the High Tower are far off in the south. Though the now sidelined Aegon had sidelined his grandfather, Sir Otto Hightower, by removing him as Hand of the King in favor of Sir Criston Cole, Sir Otto's orders and entreaties were still doing work. However distant, their power was considerable. A high tower-led army could make a huge difference in the war if it could be brought up from the south. If the Reach had been united under the Greens, they likely could have gotten together one or more large armies quickly. But the high towers, far from uniting the Reach as a whole, couldn't even unite their direct vassals. Obedient to his uncle's entreaties, Lord Ormond Hightower had issued forth from Old Town with a thousand knights, a thousand archers, three thousand men-at-arms, and uncounted thousands of camp followers, sellswords, free riders, and rabble, only to find himself set upon by Sir Alan Beesbury and Lord Alan Tarley. Even though the Allen duo's force was small, they were effective, and I'd guess they were determined. Sir Allen Beesbury would likely be fighting to avenge Lord Lyman Beesbury. If you recall, he was the venerable master of coin the Greens disposed of upon Viserys' death because he wouldn't go along with their coup. Well, that was Allen's grandfather. 
The most popular version of that story tells us Sir Criston killed Lord Lyman, but another version says Lord Lyman died in the dungeons after being sent there by Sir Otto. This is significant because, if true, it means that Sir Otto is responsible for the death of one of his family's vassal lords. The core of the vassal lord relationship structure, in simple terms, is protection in exchange for service. Imprisoning and killing a respected vassal is no doubt a violation of those terms. The idea for all this came from the High Towers, too. Let's recall, Aegon II had to be convinced initially by them and Sir Criston Cole. It's pretty hard to find a version of this story where House Beesbury hasn't been severely mistreated. So it's not unlikely that there was some bad blood here, as Old Town could be seen as the primary instigator. The seat of House Beesbury is Honeyholt, resting north of Old Town on the same river, the Honeywine. The Tarleys are, of course, from Horn Hill, not far to the east. Perhaps Lord Ormond could have overcome these two, but Lord Costain of Three Towers started raiding his baggage train from the south as well, it became a bit of a mess from there. Beesbury is a direct vassal of the High Towers. Opposition would be a huge dishonor if not for the slaying of their kinsmen. That gives them solid Cassus Belly. But the Costains are also a direct vassal of Old Town, and their reasons are less clear. But they weren't an exception either. It seems the High Towers of this era did not impress several of their vassals by starting this war. This implies perhaps they were left out a bit. As well, perhaps, the Costains may have also seen Lord Beesbury's death as an affront, somewhat similarly to how Aerys II's execution of Rickard and Brandon Stark would ultimately lead to John Arryn calling his banners. A strike at one fellow Hightower vassal was perhaps viewed as a strike at all of them. In some cases, the lords are simply maintaining their oath to Viserys I and Queen Rhaenyra over that of the High Towers, but still, typically, these older, close geographical relationships are stronger, so it's quite notable that the High Towers had so many defections. There's more. Another army in the Reach, loyal to Queen Rhaenyra, led by Lord Rowan and Sir Tom Flowers, the Bastard of Bitterbridge, was forming between Lord Ormond and King's Landing. So he decided he could not advance given the conditions and sent word to the capital asking for dragons. Apparently he sat there waiting too long, and eventually Lord Rowan's forces moved south, and the Hightower forces found themselves with an army in front of them, a river to the west, and their retreat to Old Town cut off by their own vassals. It looked grim. What a blow it would be for the Hightowers to lose a large battle and possibly an army so close to Old Town. The Blacks pressed what seemed to be their advantage. When their hosts closed around him on the banks of the river Honeywine, attacking front and rear at once, Lord Hightower saw his lines crumble. Defeat seemed imminent, until a shadow swept across the battlefield and a terrible roar resounded overhead, slicing through the sounds of steel on steel. A dragon had come. The dragon was Tessarium, the Blue Queen, Cobalt, and Copper. Tessarion was ridden by Prince Daron. He was Lord Ormond's squire, arriving just in time. I do wonder why he was still in Old Town and not with his lord, but he was a prince, so who knows. But maybe he just didn't like being left behind. The arrival of the Blue Queen and Daron Targaryen reversed the course of the battle entirely. She was the proverbial jaws of victory, and only Lord Rowan of the five opposing leaders remained in the field afterwards. Sir Tom Flowers was killed by Dragonfire, while Lord Costain was slain by Bold John Roxton and his Valyrian steel sword Orphan Maker. If Lord Costain had any children, the sword reaffirmed its name. The two Allens were captured and are not mentioned again. Lord Thaddeus Rowan might later wish he had been forgotten by history too, though we won't see why until a couple years after the war. He's one to remember. Victorious, Lord Ormond perhaps finally realized his own strength. He had been too cautious to advance initially. Ironically, the two Allens and Lord Rowan may have been better off simply allowing Lord Ormond to believe he was at a disadvantage. By forcing battle, he was given direct proof of the power of his own army when combined with Tessarion, whom he seems to have underestimated. With his Valyrian steel sword Vigilance, Lord Ormond Hightower knighted Prince Daron and dubbed him Daron the Daring. 
the prince was quite humble about his honors and his contribution to the battle, suggesting the victory belonged to the Blue Queen. This indicates a personality quite different from his elder brothers, Prince Aemond and King Aegon. His conduct would continue to help the war effort for a time, unlike other elements of his family. As a dragon-riding prince, he could probably have demanded or even expected command, but he did no such thing. While Sir Criston and Prince Aemond will quarrel over plans and strategy and ultimately operate separately, what we see here with Lord Ormond and Tessarion is the effectiveness of an army supported by a dragon working in concert. For the most part, this is the only time we see a dragon and an army work together for an extended period, and it's highly effective. Though the Blue Queen wasn't large, the army was, and the Blacks had no dragons of their own in the south. And everyone knew that. The Greens marched onwards. With Tessarion as a scout, the army was able to move more boldly than most. A human atop a dragon doesn't see as well as, say, a skin changer with an eagle, but a dragon has a lot more uses. Many would have been terrified to see it on the horizon, common folk and lords and ladies alike. We're told the queen's armies often melted away at the sight of the blue dragon. By having the only dragon in the south, the Greens systematically moved through several key locations, taking submissions and adding new men to their armies each time. Sometimes they met with resistance, but it wasn't a united response, and none of the challenges were notable. There's an inherent issue with confronting an army led by a dragon when yours lacks one. The more men you have massed together, the more damage a dragon can do with a single blast of flame. So the bigger your army gets the more risk you face from a dragon. If your soldiers are scattered, it's much harder for a dragon to pick them all off individually. But you can't mount an effective defense against an army of thousands when scattered like that. So they're damned if they do, damned if they don't. Thus, the army of the Blue Queen marched along the coast and won more easy victories. They took submissions from the lords of the Shield Islands, the Oak Hearts, and the Rowans of Golden Tree, whose Lord Thaddeus had fought against them on the Honeywine. In the case of the Shields, it's unlikely the army sailed for the islands, and certainly not all of them. So we suspect Prince Daron flew alone onto Sarian to one or more of the Shields. This begs a question. Would it not be fairly easy to capture or kill him in such a case? Yes, actually, but it is not the taking or the keeping or even the killing of the prince that is the problem. It's what comes next. Start with the dragon. It's not a situation where the dragon will go berserk and destroy everything in sight. Well, I don't think it would. I don't really know for sure. Which is basically the point here. The lords of the Shield Islands and elsewhere couldn't have known that either. All they'd know is that if they did anything to Prince Daron, they'd still have the Blue Queen to contend with. If they're lucky, maybe the dragon flies away. But maybe she gets angry waiting for her master to return, or maybe she decides she likes your island or your castle. She is a queen, after all. Not just that, what if the Greens win? You've slain one of their princes, so that's that for you and perhaps your family too. So while the dragon and dragon prince may have appeared to be alone, they were effectively backed by an army. Why take the risk? Why indeed. With the southern and western areas of the Reach seemingly secured, they continued to move up the Mander inexorably towards Long Table and other important targets. This would have involved crossing the Mander, and here we see another advantage of a dragon attached to an army. Normally crossing a river can be risky. We've seen it a lot of times in A Song of Ice and Fire. It's at the very least not a thing done lightly. A small army can make a large army's crossing very difficult, if not impossible. We saw it when Tywin attempted to cross his army over the Red Fork in A Song of Ice and Fire. Catapults from River Run and the shoreline sank rafts full of men, while Tywin's army could not return any such fire of their own. If there was any question of opposing the crossing of Lord Ormond's army, it was answered by the presence of the Blue Queen. Hightower's host had crossed the Manda and was advancing slowly on King's Landing, smashing the Queen's loyalists wherever and whenever they encountered them and forcing every lord who bent the knee to add their strength to his own. So indeed it seems they advanced on Long Table easily enough, whereupon they placed it under siege. That put them ever closer to Bitterbridge, Tumbleton, and King's Landing. Though Ormond was slow to get going, his army was becoming a monstrous threat. He 
He and Prince Daron were making slow progress, but it was steady and productive. Rather than destroying everything in their path, they were adding those they beat to their own strength. Instead of sowing seeds of future rebellion or driving houses into the hands of the blacks, they treated the defeated with honor. This was a markedly different approach than what we just saw from the green leadership in the Crown Lands, where slaughtered garrisons and executed prisoners, highborn or not, were typical. When Rook's rest fell to the Greens, it was quickly retaken by the Blacks. But once these southern seats pledged to Aegon II, they didn't easily turn again. While Vagar could be avoided to a certain degree, the High Tower army would have to be dealt with directly. It would eventually reach the vicinity of King's Landing, whereupon it would link up with the rest of the Greens. As dangerous as the army was with Tessarion, imagine it with Tessarion and Vagar, as well as more soldiers and the feared leader Sir Criston Cole. If Damon thought facing Vagar was a bad idea, what would he think of facing that? Better to prevent such an army from ever coming together in the first place. Better to face a large army than a larger army. This would come to a head soon. Radio Westeros and History of Westeros are supported by patrons. And so now around the midway point, we'll take a moment to say thanks. Thanks to Radio Westeros Valyrian Steel patrons, Arodo, Aileen, Akiva of House Hunt, Oxheart, Amber, Hortense of Ashai, B-Word, the Queen Beyond the Wall, Blythe Spirit, Catherine, Chris K, Christian, Margie the Mage, David, Dean, Dibbles and Bits, Drew, Eliana Targaryen, Sir Source Delica, Lord Sosa and his faithful canine companion Theoden, Jill, John H., J.M., Herbert Westeros, the Miskatonic Maester, Jonah of House Eco, Casey, Lady of the Frostfangs, Lady Silverwing, Infandaris, the Unspeakable Terror, Lady Steelwind, Sharon of Littlefield, Boss, the Sothorian, Sammy, Scotty, Tim, and Lady Dyerliz of Castle Naki, the Alpha Patron. And thanks as well to the History of Westeros, Queen of Love and Beauty patrons. From the depths of Flea Bottom, Lord Ken of House Hammer has declared for Queen Carrie, Fire of the North, who recovered Dark Sister from beyond the wall. A Laurel of Glory in the name of love to Bud of House Beresford, Knight of Tolkien and Arbiter of Scotch, from Sandy the Dragon, Blood of Queen Daenerys, and Lady of Jameson. And the history of Westeros Blood Riders, Koho Koe, called Sun Piercer, wielder of a dragonbone bow. Kokavo the Tamer, wielder of the wildfire whip, Gehenna. In the history of Westeros, Northern Champions, Jay Wilson, Winter's King, Winter's King, Lord of the First Men, Lady Air Ardross, Mother of Wolves, wielder of the Valyrian Steel Claymore, Manticore, Jake Snow, aka Jacob Ice Eyes, the Bastard of the Last River, Lord Darren of House Rambler, the last hunt is ceaseless. Lady Bobby of House Mitchell, Gandalf the White, Lord of House Seamorn, Sharia Skein, last of the Long Night archaeologists and wielder of untested hypothesis of Valyrian steel trowel with a dragon bone handle, Lady Nicole of House Anime, the small can be powerful, captain of Sweet Camellia, and Adelard the Wanderer, wielder of the Valyrian steel axe Frostfall. Dragonstone, sowing the seeds. At the outset of the conflict, the Greens had but six dragons with riders and one egg at their disposal, while the Blacks could count eight dragons with riders plus two eggs in the hands of potential dragon riders. In addition, the Blacks enjoyed the benefit of holding Dragonstone, which held a wealth of dragon's eggs, and was also home to six riderless dragons. The so-called tame dragons, Vermithor, Silverwing, and Sea Smoke, who had made their lairs there since the deaths of their riders, King Jaehaerys, Queen Alysanne, and Laenor Valerion, respectively, and three wild dragons that had never been ridden, Grey Ghost, Sheep Stealer, and the Cannibal. Following the Blood and Cheese incident, in which one of the Green's riders was murdered and two others effectively traumatized to the point they could no longer be considered as assets, and the wounding of both Sunfire the Golden and his rider at Rook's Rest, and considering the deaths of two of their own dragons, Lucerus's Arax and Rhaenys's Maelys, 
The Blacks now thought to neutralize the strength of the Greens' remaining dragons, which were essentially now only the young dragon Tessarion, ridden by Prince Daron, who was coming up slowly from the south, and Aemond One-Eye's mighty Vagar. They would do this by capitalizing on their advantage in riderless dragons. Those six riderless dragons would give the Blacks an apparently insurmountable advantage in the air. And to that end... Not long after the defeat at Rook's Rest, Jacaris, Prince of Dragonstone, set about organizing the search for riders. A promising young man of nearly 15 years himself, Jacaris, as Rhaenyra's eldest son, followed up on the apparent success of his mission to the Vale and the North, and he began to come to the fore. With his mother grief-stricken over the loss of Lucerys and Prince Daemon still in the Riverlands, it fell to Jace during those days to fulfill the terms of his promises to Lady Jane Arryn in the Vale and to take steps to ensure the safety of his younger brothers. It was also he who soothed the anger and grief of his grandfather, the Sea Snake, over the loss of his wife, Princess Rhaenys, by naming him Hand of the Queen. Lord Corlys is a rare good choice for leadership amidst so many bad leaders in the dance, and it was Prince Jacaris and Lord Corlys who began making plans for the Blacks' attack on King's Landing, where they hoped to take out the Greens' most significant force multiplier, Aemon's Vagar, by virtue of superior numbers. Jace reasoned that if Fermax, Cyrax, and Caraxes were to descend on King's Landing, even that hoary old bitch would be unable to withstand them. Contrast this with Prince Daemon's innate caution in the matter of dragons. Vagar specifically. Jace may have been promising, but he was still very young and inexperienced in dragon versus dragon warfare. That wasn't an experience many people had, to be fair. Really, only his uncle, Aemon One-Eye. But Daemon knew enough about dragons and warfare individually to know what a fight with Vagar would mean. Jace was clearly guilty of over-optimism, but he was also easily convinced that even more dragons would be better for the Blacks. And so, to that end, the Blacks turned to the population of Dragonstone, seeking riders, allegedly at the urging of Mushroom, who, by his own report, told the prince to look for dragon riders under the sheets and in the woodpiles, wherever you Targaryens spilled your silver seed could not be denied that the Targaryens had held sway over the rocky island for more than 200 years, and during that time there had been no small amount of mingling between Targaryen men and the wives and daughters of the peasants and fisherfolk of Dragonstone. In fact, Gildane notes that prior to the reign of Jaehaerys and Alysanne, quote, the ancient rite of the first night had been invoked mayhaps more oft on Dragonstone than anywhere else in the Seven Kingdoms. And he goes on to say that the children, resulting from those and other unions, were by and large honored with gifts and esteem. They were said to be born of dragon seed and eventually called seeds for short. And so Prince Jacaris announced that any man who could master one of the six riderless dragons would be granted lands and riches, knighted, and have their children ennobled. While the declaration that any such would also have the honor of riding into battle along Jacaris might seem more pretentious than rewarding, there was no shortage of men who answered the call. In what became known as the sowing of the seeds, or simply the red sowing, more than 16 men would lose their lives with another 50 wounded or maimed in the effort to seat riders on those six dragons. Among those who died were the Lord Commander of Rhaenyra's Queen's Guard, Stefan Darklin, whose attempts to mount sea smoke were met with flame, and Lord Gorman Massey, who met the same fate when he approached Vermithor. Many others died attempting to approach the wild dragons before the season of fire and blood at last ended, with all three of the tame dragons being claimed, and almost improbably, one of the wild ones as well. And who were these riders who would soon enter the fray as dragon seeds? The pair who had claimed the famed mounts of the old king and good queen Alysanne, Vermithor and Silverwing, were, like most of the seeds, natives of Dragonstone. A blacksmith's bastard, known as Hugh Hammer, mounted Vermithor, while a man-at-arms called Ulf the White, for his silvery hair, claimed Silverwing. Both were knighted as promised, though the question of grants of lands and titles would be deferred. 
The third seed was more fortunate. The young Adam of Hull claimed Laenor Valerian's dragon Sea Smoke for his own, a highly appropriate choice since his mother Marilda, also known as Mouse, the daughter of a shipwright from Hull on Driftmark, came forward with Adam and his younger brother Alan at the call for seeds and claimed they were the bastard children of the late Laenor Valerian, sired around the time of his marriage to Rhaenyra. Both boys had silver hair and purple eyes, and had spent much of their young lives at sea with their mother. But given the persistent rumors of Laenor's sexuality, many doubted the tale that he was their father. Lord Corlys, however, seemed to accept it at face value, and it was he who brought the boys to Rhaenyra to participate in the sewing, and later asked the queen to legitimize them so that he could make young Adam his heir. That she assented so readily might seem to be a bit strange, since her own sons were at least nominally also Laenor's sons, and she could have just as easily demanded that the youngest of her Valerian sons, Joffrey, be named heir to Driftmark. Did Rhaenyra unconsciously tip her hand with regard to the parentage of her three eldest children? It's a good question. Or did she perhaps know what many others on Dragonstone suspected, that the two young men were in fact the sons of the sea snake himself, now revealed as Valerians due to the death of Princess Rhaenys, who would surely have objected to accepting her husband's by-blows into the family? While both Adam and his brother Alan were duly legitimized and made lawful heirs of Lord Corlys, no one ever confirmed the actual facts of their parentage. In favor of Laenor being their father, we have the fact that when the boys were sired, Lord Corlys was over 60 years old, nearly four times the age of Marilda of Hull, while Laenor was a youth of about 20. That can hardly be seen as corroboration, though, and so perhaps more to the point is the fact that there were no recorded dragon riders in House Valarian until Lena and Lanor, who had a dragon-riding Targaryen mother. But Valarians and Targaryens had been intermarrying for centuries, so it seems likely that even Corlys must have had some amount, no matter how small, of actual Targaryen, not just Valyrian, blood. And we also have to agree that a preference for men at the time of his marriage to Rhaenyra doesn't mean Laenor didn't also like women or didn't like women at some point. The two aren't mutually exclusive, after all. And we have the case of Renly Baratheon, who most would agree was able to consummate his marriage to Marjorie Tyrell in spite of his ongoing relationship with her brother. That Laenor is noted to have always preferred the company of boys and squires may not rule out his father encouraging him to sow his oats among the shipyards of Hull, or him realizing the importance of it himself. Nonetheless, since it's Mushroom who most stridently insists that the sea snake was the boy's father, and since it was the sea snake himself who petitioned for their legitimacy, we have to give a large amount of credence to that interpretation. And so, while Hugh and Ulf had to wait for their lands and castles, Adam Valerian's future seemed assured. That his brother Alan, having failed in his own attempt to claim the wild dragon Sheepstealer, was similarly honored, just might have rankled with Hugh and Ulf, though for now, they had all the appearance of being loyal vassals. And speaking of Sheepstealer, it was this wild dragon, an ugly, mud-brown creature, hatched in the old king's youth, who, of the three wild dragons, at last accepted a rider. The winner of the prize was a young girl noted to be just as brown as the dragon, the daughter of a, quote, dockside whore who was called Nettles, or Nettie. While her uncertain birth is noted by maesters, based on later events, there are many who believe that Nettles was, in fact, the daughter of Prince Daemon Targaryen. In this, we would differ from Mushroom, who would one day fuel the rumors that the rogue prince had taken the young girl as his lover. But for now, that's in the future. Nettles was described as black-haired, brown-eyed, brown-skinned, skinny, foul-mouthed, and fearless. She tamed Sheepstealer by bringing the wild dragon a freshly slaughtered sheep each day until the dragon lost its fear of her. Because Nettles used a simple conditioning tactic to tame her dragon and did not have the obvious Valyrian look shared by the other seeds, there are those who declare that her existence is proof that so-called dragon blood is not necessary to control dragons. And while there really is no proof of Nettle's ancestry either way, we see no reason to rule her out as a dragon seed. She was born on Driftmark, as were Adam and Alan Valerian, and if she perhaps favored her mother's coloring rather than her unknown Valerian ancestors, she is no different from other Targaryens or Targaryen descendants known to be dark of hair or complexion, like Baylor Breakspear, 
Rhaegar's daughter Rhaenys, the descendants of the first Black Pearl, and the future Aegon IV and Braavos, and possibly even Brown Ben Plum in the main story. Lots of examples. In fact, if we accept the author's words that keeping the bloodline pure was important to Valyrians for maintaining control of their dragons, the significance of nettles might be to show that a drop of dragon blood could actually be sufficient for that effort. Fast-forwarding to the main narrative, this could prove to be important for a likely dragon seed who has some parallels with Nettles, the aforementioned Brown Ben Plum, but not for Quentin Martell, clearly. Whether Ben Plum ever controls a dragon as his story seems to hint he might, the very idea that dragon seeds could be hiding in plain sight is a compelling one, and one that could have a lot of resonance in the main narrative. As for the Dance of the Dragons, before we move on from the discussion of dragon seeds to what came next, we have to point out the essential flaw in this plan of the Blacks to capitalize on their force multipliers. While it was one thing for Corliss Valerian to champion the rights of his bastard grandsons or sons, whatever the case may be, to be dragon riders, it seems to us to be quite another for Rhaenyra to approve handing two of the most powerful dragons at their disposal to men of unknown quality. And we're not talking about the quality of their birth, but of their characters. The dangers inherent in handing nuclear weapons over to men whose characters were completely untried cannot be overstated. And if it sounds like we're prophesying that this would turn out to be a bad idea when we say, what was Rhaenyra thinking? Well, that's no accident at all. In the end, the sowing yielded four new dragon riders for the Blacks. At the same time, Jacarys, as mentioned, had made the decision to send his three younger brothers away from Dragonstone, ostensibly for their own safety. 11-year-old Joffrey was sent to the Vale with his dragon Taraxes and his cousin Rhaena Targaryen, in fulfillment of Jace's promise to the Maiden of the Vale to defend her lands with the dragon. Betrothed to the daughter of Lord Desmond Manderley, another of Jace's promise made on his diplomatic mission to the North, Joffrey wasn't happy about being sent away from the action, but his elder brother promised he was going as a defender. Reyna of Pentos brought three dragon eggs along with her, hoping that one would hatch so that she could join the ranks of her family's dragon riders. Rhaenyra's two younger sons, Aegon and Viserys, her children with Daemon, were nine and seven years old respectively, and Jace decided they would be safest in Essos. Through Prince Daemon's contacts in Pentos, he made arrangements to have the two boys fostered by the Prince of Pentos until their mother should secure her throne, and they set out with Aegon's dragon Stormcloud and Viserys' egg aboard a cog called Gay Abandon with seven Velaryon warships as escort. Now only two of Rhaenyra's and Daemon's brood remained on Dragonstone. Jacarys himself and his stepsister and cousin Bela, to whom he had been betrothed since she was a year old. Bela took after her father, Prince Daemon, in many things, and the fierce young woman declared her desire to be married quickly to Jacarys and to ride into battle beside him, a stride moon dancer, though she had yet to actually mount the young dragon. This was not to be, however, for as it happened, a new crisis quickly blossomed for the Blacks on Dragonstone. In the previous installment of this series, we talked about Sir Otto Hightower's campaign of quills and ravens. While the slow pace of those diplomatic efforts had frustrated his grandson Aegon, leading to Sir Otto being replaced as hand by Kristen Cole, as the year drew to a close and Jace began to plan his assault on King's Landing, those letters at last bore the bitter fruit that we mentioned in that episode. The kingdom of the three daughters, Mir, Lys, and Tyrosh, had finally taken the offer of Aegon's former hand into consideration and had launched a fleet of more than 90 warships with the express intent of clearing the gullet of Valyrian warships and reopening King's Landing to trade, to which they had been promised exclusive rights. Gay Abandon and her escort unknowingly sailed directly into this fleet. The seven warships were sunk or captured, as was Gay Abandon. The blacks on Dragonstone only received word of the invading fleet when young Prince Aegon arrived, quote, desperately clinging to the neck of his dragon, Stormcloud. Mushroom would relate that the boy was white with terror, shaking like a leaf and stinking of piss. The nine-year-old Aegon had never ridden his dragon before that moment of absolute necessity. 
and he never would again, as Storm Cloud would die within an hour of their arrival on Dragonstone from the wounds of numerous arrows and scorpion bolts that he suffered as the pair made their escape from the deck of the captured ship. Aegon was irrevocably traumatized by the experience. The terror of his first flight over water while in mortal peril from a rain of bolts and arrows and the guilt of having left his younger brother Viserys behind with no dragon to carry him away left him deeply scarred emotionally. In the meantime, Viserys tried to hide his identity by concealing his dragon egg and changing his clothing so that he looked like a ship's boy. But he was soon discovered and delivered as a captive to the Lysene Admiral of the fleet, Sharako Lokar. Targaryen princeling and a dragon egg? That's extremely valuable. A major win for Admiral Lokar and a major loss for the Blacks. Within only a day or two, the Blacks would suffer an even greater loss and a great win. Smoke and salt, Battle of the Gullet. On the fifth day of the new year, after encountering the eight ships bound for Pentos, the Triarchy's fleet entered the Gullet, with half taking the north route between Dragonstone and Crackclaw Point, and half passing to the south between Dragonstone and Massey's Hook. Though their approach with the rising sun at the backs took the fleet of House Valarian by surprise, the blacks on Dragonstone had nonetheless been forewarned by Aegon's arrival on the dying storm cloud. Jace mounted Vermax and flew out to meet the attackers, sweeping down on a line of approaching Lyseni warships and setting them ablaze. When he was joined by the four seeds astride their dragons, Hugh Hammer, Ulf the White, Adam Valarian, and Nettles, the attacking ships began to turn away. But tragedy soon struck Rhaenyra's blacks again, when Vermax was either struck by a bolt or a grapnel, accounts differ, and became entangled in the rigging of a burning, sinking galley. Dragged down by the weight of the ship, Vermax sunk beneath the waves. It is said that Jaceris Valerion leapt free and clung to a piece of smoking wreckage for a few heartbeats, until some crossbowmen on the nearest Mira's ship began loosing quarrels at him. The prince was struck once, and then again. More and more Mir men brought crossbows to bear. Finally, one quarrel took him through the neck, and Jace was swallowed by the sea. The battle continued to rage for the rest of the day and night. Spice Town on Driftmark was brutally sacked, and Lord Corlys's high tide put to the torch. All of Lord Valarian's treasures and many of his retainers were lost. The town would never be rebuilt, and the Valarians returned thereafter to their ancestral seat at Castle Driftmark instead. In the end, only 28 of the Triarchy's 90 ships would sail back to Essos. The predominance of Lyseni ships among their number led to the disgrace of the Lyseni Admiral and the eventual crumbling of the Alliance of the Three Daughters. The disgraced Admiral would quietly sell his prize captive to Magister Bembaro Bazan of Lys for his weight in gold and the promise of support. In the meantime, Prince Viserys was presumed dead by all in Westeros and Magister Bazan, no doubt looking to capitalize on his prize one day in the future, did nothing to disabuse the boy's family of that notion. While the battle in the gullet was ultimately considered a victory for the Blacks, who drove off the invading fleet, it is reckoned as one of the bloodiest sea battles in history. Corlys Valerian, in its aftermath, is known to have said, If this be victory, I pray I never win another. A line very similar to that one from Pyrrhus of Iparis, who said, supposedly, one other such victory would utterly undo me. The incredible cost paid by the Blacks in terms of their naval superiority and the loss of resources of the fabulously wealthy House Valerian paled in comparison to the human cost. The death of Jaceres, just as he was coming into his own as a prince and leader of men, the emotional toll upon his brother Aegon, and the loss of Prince Viserys to an unknown fate. If Rook's Rest was a Pyrrhic victory for the Greens, then surely the Battle of the Gullet was a Pyrrhic victory for the Blacks. It was a watershed moment. Following the loss of Lucerys, Rhaenyra had seemed broken. The death of her eldest son and heir affected her differently, and she seemed to be left with nothing but hatred in her mind. Still possessed of more dragons than her half-brother, her grace now resolved to use them, no matter the cost. She would rain fire and death upon Aegon and all those who supported him, she told the Black Council, and either tear him from the Iron Throne or die in the attempt. And of the Black's remaining dragon riders, Adam Valarian and Nettles were badly shaken by the battle. Only Hugh Hammer and Ulf the White seemed to celebrate the victory, 
As bloody as it was, we're reminded of Amond after Rook's rest. Not a man to emulate. Their words of celebration should have been an ominous warning to anyone who heard them. It was reported that when Hugh declared, We are knights now, truly, Ulf replied, Fie on that, we should be lords. Such naked ambition from men who had been granted the power and freedom to control two of the most powerful living creatures in Westeros, Vermithor and Silverwing, was perhaps to be expected. But Rhaenyra, for now, was too consumed with thoughts of vengeance, and her hand, the sea snake, by his own losses, to notice. Their oversight would one day prove disastrous. For now, House Targaryen was reeling from what could be called self-inflicted wounds, in total, three princes and a princess dead, along with four dragons. Prince Viserys lost and presumed dead, and Aegon the Elder and his dragon both badly wounded physically. Helena, Jahera, and arguably Aegon the Younger were all so emotionally scarred that they could no longer be counted as whole, and certainly not as potential combatants from Dragonback. The board had been tilted and shaken, and those who remained in the game were hardened, and resolved more than ever to wreak bitter destruction upon their opponents. It was fitting then when a raven bearing Damon's letter arrived. Dark wings, dark words indeed, but this time for the greens. Black takes King's Landing. Recall that Aemond One-Eye, with the same fierce resolve that motivated his half-sister, decided the time had come to march upon Harrenhal and his uncle Damon. He and his brother's hand, Kristen Cole, left King's Landing with few defenders, but for the gold cloaks and a small company of household knights. And so it was that when Damon, who still had friends inside the capital, received the news that his nephew was marching, he sent messages to his wife and others, mounted Craxies, and headed south. Damon, it must be said, was far too canny of a battle commander not to have expected exactly such a move by the impulsive young Aemond. He was likely waiting for just this opportunity or one very similar to it. Keeping well out of sight of Cole's line of march, with Aemond flying above on Vagar, Damon made his way to the Blackwater and approached King's Landing from the west, even as Rhaenyra came from Dragonstone in the east, astride Syrax. The sight of the two dragons above the city led to a panic in the streets, since with Aemon and Vagar marching north and Daron and Tessarion still in the reach, the city was effectively defenseless against dragons, since the few who remained in the dragon pit were more or less riderless. In addition, the sight of Prince Daemon in the sky was, unbeknownst to the greens inside the city, a signal to his friends in the city watch, who quietly imprisoned or killed the captains at all seven of the city's gates. The city had effectively fallen before the Greens were even aware of their fate. Dowager Queen Alicent sent riders to alert Kristen Cole and Aemond, but they never left the gates, being stopped by men loyal to the Prince of the City, as Prince Damon had long been known. Grandmaster Orwile attempted to reach the rookery to send ravens to lords loyal to Aegon, but was seized by gold cloaks and imprisoned in the black cells. And when Queen Alicent's brother, Gawain Hightower, second in command of the Gold Cloaks, attempted to flee on horseback to sound the alarm, he was seized and brought before the commander, Sir Luther Largent. A fearsome fighter, nearly seven feet tall, Largent was rumored to have once killed a warhorse with a single punch. And while George might have used this warhorse killing giant in another setting before, we're looking at you, Gregor Clegane. We think that this particular scene might actually be more of an homage to one of George's favorite characters from his youth, Robert E. Howard's Conan the Barbarian, who killed the camel with a single punch, not only in the comic book version, but in the 1982 movie as well. It's always fun to find these possible influences and homages, and with a writer of George's background, they're bound to happen often. Now, Largent had been promoted from captain to commander of the City Watch by the Green Council, who initially saw him as favorable to Aegon's cause. To be fair, they also made Gawain Hightower his second, because they didn't fully trust him. The fact that they kept him, though, speaks to the influence that the commander of the City Watch holds in the transition of power. It's entirely possible that had they gotten rid of him, by fair means or foul, the Watch would have just revolted against Aegon's rule. Unfortunately for Gawain Hightower... Largent's loyalty to Aegon did turn out to be a misconception. When Hightower cursed Largent for a turn cloak, Largent reportedly laughed and said, Damon gave us these cloaks and they're gold, no matter how you turn them, before spitting the queen's brother on his sword and commanding the gates to be open to the men who were now arriving on the quays aboard the Sea Snake's warships. 
With Rhaenyra's soldiers pouring into the city from six of the seven gates, a small force of loyal Hightower knights and men-at-arms held out for around eight hours at the river gate, the final blow fell when four more dragons appeared in the sky above the city. One by one, the dragons landed upon the city's hills, Vermithor and Silverwing upon the Hill of Rhaenys near the Dragon Pit, Sheepstealer upon Visenya's Hill, and First Daemon, and then, when it was deemed safe, Rhaenyra upon Aegon's High Hill. Adam Valerian continued to patrol the city walls from the sky on sea smoke. Imagine the terror of the people within the city. Many fled out the open gates seeking safety in the open country. Still others dug pits and tunnels to hide in. We're told a lot of these tunnels and hidden cellars still exist in King's Landing now, and they're probably where the wildfire stashes were left by Aerys's pyromancers. It'll be a huge irony if these shelters from fire turn out to be the source of bigger fire in the future. Clearly a majority of people expected the city to burn. Riots broke out in Flea Bottom and looters began to rampage through the city streets. At the Red Keep, Queen Allison emerged from Magor's Holdfast accompanied by her father, Sir Tylan Lannister, and Lord Jasper Wilde. When she suggested negotiations or even a council to decide the outcome, Rhaenyra bluntly laid out her choice. Yield or burn? Allison yielded, but not without making a final dig at her stepdaughter. The city is yours, princess, but you will not hold it long. The rats play when the cat is gone. But my son Aemon will return with fire and blood. With regards to the first statement, Allison might be called somewhat prophetic. As to the second, time would prove that she was somewhat overconfident. It's a fitting parallel to our opening historical example, where Demetrius, son of one-eyed Antigonus, is similar to one-eyed Aemon, having left his father improperly defended, just as Allison was similarly unprotected here. Allison and Antigonus both expected their sons to come to the rescue, but they did not. In the moment, Rhaenyra's men swept into Magor's and found Aegon's wife, Helena, locked in her chamber. But who they didn't find was of far greater importance. Aegon himself, last known to be in his bed, recovering from the injuries he sustained at Rook's Rest under the influence of Milk of the Poppy, was gone. So too were his children, six-year-old Jahera and two-year-old Maelor, along with two knights of the Kingsguard, Sir Willis Fell and Sir Rickard Thorne. None could or would say where they had gone. Also missing was Lord Laris Strong, Aegon's master of whisperers, who, like the good spy he was, knew all of the secret ways in and out of the city. Just where the missing had gone would not become known for weeks, or in some cases months, but Rhaenyra's most pressing concern at the moment was securing the city. To that end, she ascended the Iron Throne and declared she would sit in her father's seat while every man and woman inside the Red Keep was brought before her and knelt to beg forgiveness and swear their fealty. Still wearing her armor, she sat throughout the night, hearing the words of her subjects. It was after dawn when Prince Damon escorted her from the throne room, and Septon Eustace asserts that the Iron Throne, inanimate object that it was, seemed to agree with Queen Alicent. As her lord husband, Prince Damon, escorted her from the hall, cuts were seen upon her grace's legs and the palm of her left hand. Drops of blood fell to the floor as she went past, and wise men looked at one another, though none dared speak the truth aloud. The Iron Throne had spurned her, and her days upon it would be few. Well, it could be true, but there's a clear embellishment that could hint at the veracity of Eustace's account. How exactly could she have cuts on her legs, let alone her palm, given we're told she was still in full armor? That said, it was a fitting symbol of how Queen Rhaenyra would rule, bleeding the city and her supporters and herself as the war continued. The new queen in town. Rhaenyra was intent on rewarding her supporters and punishing her foes. Grand Maester Orwell was left in the Black Cells and replaced by Girardis. This is traditionally the decision of the Citadel, not the Iron Throne, but we don't suppose they could say no here. I would not. Supporters of Rhaenyra, who had been held captive there by the Greens, were released and rewarded. 
Rewards were also offered for information on the whereabouts of Aegon and his two children, as well as Larry Strong and the two Kingsguard knights who had accompanied them in their flight. Queen Alicent was kept in golden chains, though as the widow of King Viserys, her life was spared. Not so lucky was her father Otto Hightower, the first to be executed. He had been Hand of the King for three kings, but was also one of the central figures in causing this war. We can only wonder, as perhaps he himself did as he was led to the block, what would have happened had he been left in charge? His planning was careful and considered, but he certainly didn't impart that kind of forward thinking on his grandchildren. Lord Jasper Wilde, a.k.a. Ironrod, the Master of Laws who asserted that the crown had to pass to a man, went to the block as well, apparently still pointing to this legality with his last breath. Sir Tylan Lannister was tortured rather than executed, in the hopes that he might have some information leading to the recovery of the treasury funds that had been moved out of King's Landing in the early days of Aegon's rule. It didn't work, as torture rarely does, though he was severely maimed and disfigured. Huge rewards were posted for information leading to the capture of the usurper styling himself Aegon II, his daughter Jahira, his son Maelor, the false knights Willis Fell and Rickard Thorne, and Laris Strong the clubfoot. When that failed to produce the desired result, her grace sent forth hunting parties of Knights Inquisitor to seek after the traitors and villains who had escaped her and punish any man found to have assisted them. Inquisitor is pretty much always synonymous with those willing to inflict pain quite casually, including torture and including on innocence. It's not certain the Queen pushed things to that degree, but it sounds a lot like it. Lords Rosby and Stokeworth, once Rhaenyra's supporters who had switched allegiance to avoid imprisonment, now tried to switch back. Declaring that, quote, faithless friends are worse than foes, Rhaenyra had the two men's lying tongues removed before executing them. Nowhere did the triumphant queen show an ounce of the mercy that her famous ancestor Jaehaerys I had shown in the wake of the brief civil war that preceded his reign. And the extra cruelty thrown in was likely seen by many as excessive. The deaths of Rosby and Stokeworth raised a new problem for Rhaenyra. Rather, the issue of succession in those two families did. Ultimately, it exacerbated a problem of which Rhaenyra seemed only marginally aware. When her husband, Prince Daemon, recommended that the daughters of the two executed lords be given in marriage to the two new dragon riders, Hugh and Ulf, along with the lands, castles, and titles of Rosby and Stokeworth, Rhaenyra instead took the advice of her hand, Corlys Velaryon. The Sea Snake pointed out that both Rosby and Stokeworth also left sons, and while Rhaenyra's inheritance in favor of her brother Aegon had been specified by her father before his death, the same could not be said of the Rosby and Stokeworth daughters. Disinherit their brothers, and a dangerous precedent might be set for other noble families, which could cause chaos in succession cases across the realm and lead to a further loss of support for the queen. It can be said that Rhaenyra responded to this new issue out of fear rather than logic. Damon, on the other hand, clearly saw the problem that had been created in his absence when Vermithor and Silverwing were ceded to these two men. They must be suitably rewarded and appeased, lest their ambitions grow above their stations. When their reward for their services turned out to be small holdings on Driftmark, Mushroom reports that... Hammer celebrated by beating one of the Queen's household knights to death in a brothel on the Street of Silk when the two men quarreled over the maidenhood of a young virgin, whilst White rode drunkenly through the alleys of Flea Bottom, clad in naught but his golden spurs. Trouble was clearly brewing with these two, and the fact that the people of King's Landing soon came to loathe them both should have been another red flag. But Rhaenyra was consumed by the more immediate problem of ready cash, the missing treasury funds sent to Old Town, Casterly Rock, and the Iron Bank by Aegon's master of coin, Tylan Lannister, left the new ruler in a bind. Rhaenyra named Lord Bartimos Celtigar as her master of coin, and he set about raising funds in the way rulers always do when times are tough, by raising taxes. Everyone in King's Landing was affected though merchants and traders had it worst. 
in another instance of failing to learn from the long and storied history of arguably the most successful Targaryen monarch, Lord Celtigar brought back all the extremely unpopular taxes that his own ancestor, Edwell Celtigar, had levied early in the reign of Jaehaerys I. And so as traitors and rebels continued to be executed and the hated taxes collected, Rhaenyra, once known as the Realm's Delight, gained a new nickname, King Magor with Teats. But apparently oblivious to any warning signs, Rhaenyra demonstrated her feeling of security by sending for her ladies and remaining sons, Aegon the Younger and Joffrey, to join her from Dragonstone and the Vale, respectively. In another decision, worrying in hindsight at the least, Rhaenyra allowed her husband's mistress, Mazaria of Lys, to, quote, emerge from the shadows and take up residence in the Red Keep. Whether or not we believe Eustace and Gildane's accounts that Daemon was, quote, still in her thrall, it cannot be denied or was certainly not forgotten that she had been the main instigator of the blood and cheese incident as she was named by blood when he was tortured by the Greens. However questionable this choice, Lady Misery, as she was now known, became the mistress of whispers in all but name and as such had eyes in every nook and cranny of King's Landing. However, while Rhaenyra made a number of questionable decisions in King's Landing and continued to suffer cuts and slices each time she sat the Iron Throne, feeding the whispers that her reign was somehow cursed, it must be said that she appeared to be near to claiming victory in the war. Gildane tells us... On Maiden's Day in the year 130 AC, the Citadel of Old Town sent forth 300 white ravens to herald the coming of winter. But Mushroom and Septon Eustace agree that this was high summer for Queen Rhaenyra Targaryen. The capital city was hers, House Valarian ruled the waves, warriors from the north and the Vale now supported her cause, as did many from the Riverlands, and yet all her half-brothers remained at large, and their dragons as well, and House Lannister and Baratheon remained in opposition to her, as of course did the Hightowers. And so Rhaenyra argued with her hand, the Sea Snake, about the actions he now proposed to take, versus things her husband Daemon suggested they do, namely Corlys Valerian's plan to offer pardons to Lords Baratheon, Hightower, and Lannister, versus Prince Daemon's suggestion that Hugh Hammer and Ulf White be rewarded with Casterly Rock and Storm's End. Rhaenyra's decision to take a middle course of offering pardons to the three lords only after defeating her half-brothers in the field led to Hugh and Ulf being sent to the Reach to face the army of the Blue Queen and Lord Ormond, while Daemon and Nettles were sent to the Trident, where Aemon still remained. This made certain some of the more decisive episodes of the war would occur away from the capital. Trading places, king and queen. The arrival of winter in the midst of a civil war almost certainly spelled doom for certain segments of the population. As we see in the main narrative following the War of the Five Kings, winter arriving on the heels of a brutal war that saw fields trampled and destroyed and holdfasts and foodstocks burned and seized by enemies arguably poses a bigger threat to the small folk than the conflict itself. People can always flee the ravages of war, but famine is much harder to escape. Winter's arrival also had an impact on Rhaenyra's allies. The Northmen would send Roderick Dustin and his Winter Wolves, seasoned warriors who would leave the North never expecting to return, to Rhaenyra's aid, but ultimately the need to prepare his people for winter would inhibit the arrival of Lord Cregan Stark, one of Rhaenyra's staunchest supporters. Lord Manderley and the Lady of the Vale were able to send men by sea from the ports of White Harbor and Gulltown, even as the snows began to fill the mountain passes. But there would be no hope of more reinforcements coming by land. For now, we turn back to Dragonstone. Since Rhaenyra had departed, ultimately bringing her court and Aegon the Younger along to the Red Keep, Dragonstone had been left in charge of Sir Robert Quince, who, it must be said, had his hands full dealing with Prince Daemon's 14-year-old daughter, Lady Bela. As we've said, Bela was every inch her father's daughter. She loved to fly her dragon, moon dancer, and had tried the Castellan's patience as she played kissing games with the local boys on Dragonstone. And when the sailors on a Volantine Cog, making its way into the harbor of Dragonstone, reported seeing two dragons fighting to the death in the sky above Dragonmount, she proposed to seek out the truth of what happened from Moondancer's back. Sir Robert forbade her from flying, though she had claimed to have no fear of the cannibal whom most of the islanders assumed had been the victorious dragon. When she attempted to defy him, she was locked in her chamber. 
And so neither Lady Bela nor the Castellan would learn of the fishing boat making its way around the island under cover of darkness that also defied the Castellan's order to give the far side of the Dragon Mount a wide berth. Inside the boat were two local fishermen, Tom Tanglebeard and his son, known as Tom Tangletongue, and their two cousins. The younger Tom was one of those who had listened to the story of the Valentine sailors and made careful note of one detail that the sailors had been quite insistent upon, the description of the two dragons. Gray and gold they was, flashing in the sun. Now, Tom was smart enough to realize that while the gray dragon was likely gray ghost, the cannibal was black and could in no way be mistaken for gold, which meant that there was a third dragon on Dragonstone that day. Earlier, we talked about the retaking of Rook's Rest, wherein the castle Princess Rhaenys and Maelys had died defending was retaken by the blacks. In that same battle, Aegon II was grievously wounded, leading to his brother Aemond becoming the effective leader of the Greens, though Aegon had recovered enough by the time Rhaenyra took control of King's Landing to secretly flee the city. At Rook's Rest, his dragon Sunfire was so badly wounded he had been left in a field there with guards to feed and watch over him as he seemed no longer capable of flying. When Lord Wallace Mooton tried to slay the wounded Sunfire, only to be slain himself along with sixty or more of his men, Sunfire, like her rider, had disappeared. But as far as anyone who paid close attention to the Valentine Sailor's story knew, there was no other golden dragon in Westeros besides Sunfire. And as fate would have it, one of the so-called cousins of Tom Tangletongue was Sir Marston Waters, a minor local knight who had achieved a position in Aegon the Elder's retinue. And it turns out that it was none other than Sir Marston Waters who had, with the help of Lord Larry Strong, stolen Aegon himself out of King's Landing aboard a fishing skiff as his sister and her dragon riders took the city. They delivered him directly to the island she had just departed from, where he had been hiding ever since. Had the dragon never made its unlikely way to the Dragonmont? Had he not battled Grey Ghost and been seen by those Valentine sailors? Had Tom Tangletongue been as dim as his stuttering made people assume he was? And had Sir Robert Quince not locked Bela Targaryen in her room because he was fed up with her headstrong ways, perhaps things might have turned out differently. But, as it happened... The fourth man in the fishing boat that no one saw was none other than Aegon the Elder, and the dragon, of course, was his own sunfire. The reunion of these two would lead to a new plot taking root at the heart of Rhaenyra's territory. While Aegon and sunfire hid and recovered together on the far side of the dragonmont, Marston and the two toms would seek out men in Rhaenyra's garrison who could be bought. High summer for Rhaenyra was in full swing, but so many enemies remained, and many, like these, she wasn't even aware of. And so things stood in the Crownlands as the year 130, and the season of battles, approached its midway point. Aegon and Rhaenyra had effectively swapped places, though she didn't know it yet, and her half-brother was simply biding his time at the one place Rhaenyra thought of as safe as her home. For one reason or another, neither of the two was sitting comfortably in their new location, and the next six months would bring even more changes in the Crown Lands and more tragedy to House Targaryen, as we'll discuss when this series continues. Quite a few notable names fell in this episode. Sir Otto Hightower, Lord Jasper Wilde, a.k.a. Ironrod, many Lords of the Reach and Crown Lands, a few elsewhere— Stefan Darklin, Lord Commander of the Queen's Guard, Prince Jacarius Velaryon, of course, heir to the Iron Throne. Two more dragons died, Stormcloud and Vermax. There are failed dragon riders, too. Last but not least, all the sailors and soldiers and camp followers and innocents in regions that felt the pain of war. Many survivors would never be the same again, perhaps envying the dead. Aegon the Younger is perhaps the most famous example, and his brother Viserys was captured and presumed dead as well. Beyond lives lost and traumatized, there was a huge amount of ships sunk, and perhaps no house lost more wealth than the Valarians. Entering the dance, they were one of the biggest non-great houses in Westeros, but their star will begin to fade afterwards, and this loss of wealth is probably the prime reason why. A lot of this is to be expected. It is a civil war, after all, and while there's nothing much civil about it, death and devastation are usually the norm in such case. But so much of it could have been avoided. 
We've used quite a few chess metaphors over the course of our analysis of this dance. They're apt in more ways than one. George is an expert chess player, so it feels natural to lean into the references. But more generally, chess is a strategy game that inherently lends itself to warfare analogies. In mid-130, as the Blacks and the Greens pass the first anniversary of their hostilities, Things are at a stalemate. The main combatants are all still alive, but many of their literal and figurative offspring, by which we mean their dragons, have been killed. We can attribute this to a lot of poor decision-making by the principles, which, in truth, is how one gets to a stalemate in chess. A series of choices by both players that are at best conservative and at worst flat-out bad lead to an unwinnable game. Prior to this episode, Aegon II kicked it off with poor choices and fired his grandfather, Sir Otto, his hand, who was probably making good choices. He certainly made better choices than his replacements, Sir Criston and Prince Aemond, who nearly got their own king killed in the first battle they planned after taking over. Then the protector of the realm, protector in quotes, and his partner left the capital and most of the royal family almost entirely unprotected. The chess equivalent of moving your king out into the open while moving all your best pieces away from it. Trading King's Landing for Harrenhal is a pyrrhic victory of sorts, just as the Gullet and Rook's Rest were victories that had terrible consequences for the victors. Lord Ormond Hightower showed some solid abilities, but that said, he only realized his own strength after his enemies attacked him. So, in turn, while he was underconfident, his enemies may have been overconfident. We saw Jaceres make a rash plan to attack King's Landing, only prevented by the attack of the Fleet of the Three Daughters. Even Lord Corliss, a very skilled commander and leader, approved of Jace's ill-advised plan. So the virus of bad decisions was infecting even those who typically act with wisdom. Lord Wallace Mouton similarly underestimated what it meant to go up against a dragon, even an injured one, and it cost his life. George R. R. Martin also showed us the pointlessness and circular nature of civil war that we highlighted in our portions called Trading Places. Aemon and Damon swapped Harrenhal for King's Landing, and Aegon II and Rhaenyra swapped Dragonstone for King's Landing. Neither side seemed to concern itself much with the fate of the common folk. Seeing all this back and forth with no real progress, only more destruction, more ego, more pride, must have been disheartening. Again, we're reminded of this succinct but powerful and widely applicable quote from Varys. Why is it always the innocents who suffer most when you high lords play your Game of Thrones? Though it's a different conversation, Cersei seems to provide a harsh but true answer. When you play the Game of Thrones, you win or you die. There is no middle ground. Thanks so much for joining us today. We hope you've enjoyed this latest installment in our joint production on the Dance of the Dragons. And now it's time for us to give credit where credit is due. Thanks so much to Ashea and Yoke Boy, who are the producers of this episode, both video and audio formats. You guys are the best. Thanks to Kevin McLeod and Kai Angle for allowing us to use their music in our production. Michael Klarfeld a.k.a. the man behind Claradox.de, the man behind the maps. Check out his site. Show him some love. Also thanks to Joey Townsend and Jesse Kowal, the History of Westeros intro and outro music composers. And as always, George R. Martin for including so very much rich, detailed history in his creations. And finally, we'll close by giving thanks to our patrons. Radio Westeros Castle Steel patrons, AJ, Aegon the Sixth, Alex, Amanda, Ando, Oakenfist, Nessie the Questing Beast, Arion, Biloba, Brian, Camille, Charitable Rereadings, Chris, Christopher, Christian, Christine, Maddie and Jessica, Clarissa, Clay, Convenience or Death, Sir Archibald Cadigan, Crimson Kate, Dag Blabla, Dan the Good, Dan S, Dimitri B, Dennis, Direwolf, Dutch, Defender of the Berm, Eric, Emily of the Irie, Ezra, Felix, Jeffrey, Sir Gladworth, Greg, History of Westeros, hey, Eden, Ingvild, Iowan Longbeard, the well-read wine gobbler from Ultima Thule, Archmaester Kobe of the Higher Mysteries, Jamie the Joint Slayer, Brendan Beefish, Jigsaw, Goldie Juke, Jim McGeehan of Wars and Politics of Ice and Fire, 
Vesivus, Joseph, John Ares, Rider of the Ice Dragon, Cenarian, the White Storm, Judson, Catherine, Lady Kelly, Mistress of the Old Day of Crabs, Brash Candy, Kevin, Tree Girl, Sir Galahoo of what? Knight of the Laughing Tree, Lauren, Liam, Lord Young of the Ghostwoods, Monaro, Geek TV, Maria, a cohort of Matts, Matt A, Matt C, Matt K, Matt L, first of his name, and Matt L, second of his name. Lady Beatrix of House Grey, Melinda, Maester Mary, Michael M, Patrick, Peter Pebble, PJ, Paul H, Paul B, Rachel, Richard, Sam, Scott Greenseer, Scott, Sebastian, Sir Daniel the Sneaky Russian, Sir Swift, Shari, Sophia, Soren, Spentrails, that shiny bastard, Steve, Tanner, Terry, Sir Terence, Knight of the Cedars, Hema Helminth, the Sellsword Sentinel, Virginie, Kuwaran Halfhand, Whitney, Woodside for Life, Yvonne, and Zainab. In the history of Westeros, Peers of the Realm, the mysterious BR, Hand of the King, Lord Stephen Stark, Titles, Titles, Hand of Queen Ashea, who is known as the Best. Lord Jim the Fortuitous of Wars and Politics of Ice and Fire blog and Warden of the West, Lord George Stormsville the Cunning, Lord of the Chiliad and Warden of the East, Cabeth the Unfrozen, Lord of the Bricks and Castle Crimson Light, Defender of the Old Gods and Warden of the North, Lord Brendan Lannister the Blood Lion, Ruler of Castle Everroar, Warden of the South, and the Elite from outside the realm, Lord James Tuttle, King of the Stepstones and the Narrow Sea, Commander of the Royal Fleet, consisting of the Narrow Fleet, led by the flagship Caraxes, and the Bloodstone Fleet, led by flagship Prince Damon. Jenny the Just, Captain of the Ghost Ship Liberty, which vanished in the Shivering Sea over a century ago, but has recently been sighted near Volantis, if the tales can be believed. King Beyond the Wall, Sidney Jesse, the Fallborn, Lord of Blue Spring and the Haunted Forest, wields a dagger of dragonglass and the Valyrian steel blade, Red Frost. And the White Walkers, array a flint of the mountain flints captured by the Weeper, only to be raised in the Valley of the Milkwater, Blue Eyes and Golden Memories. Alexander Greyblood, first of the first men, now crowned in ice, called Silence Bringer, Wood Blinder, and the Snow of Night, wielder of the ice forged greatsword, Pale Frost. The lords and ladies in their castles, Lady Dire Liz of Castle Naki, the Alpha Patron, Lord Dan of the Red Mountains and Castle Great Bell, Breaker of the Second Stone, Gregor the Toasty, Lord of the Breadfort, Ashlyn Winter, the Hawk's Eye, Lady of Castle Skyfall, the Lord of the Halls of Castle Hillcrest, wielder of the Valyrian Steel Machete, Everglazed, Lord Bemmy Snuggle Bunny, Guardian Ranger of the Hidden Hundred Acre Weirwood, Dual Wielder of Valyrian Short Swords, Glorious Morning, and Little Light Wiss, Sharpshooter of the Weirwood and Ironwood Laminated Longbow, Todd Von Oben. When you fear things cannot get worse, Snuggle Bunny enters the fray. The Bastard of the Wolfswood, First Forester of the Old Gods, Sworn to House Iron Weirwood, Listen for the Silence. Casey Stark of House Acres, Lady Dillsdale, the Star Spear of Crescent Hill, Mistress of the Dornish Marches. Peter Rivers, the Pale Dragon and Heir to Bloodraven. Lady Carlin Carey of Castle Stonesharp, whose horse is shod in Valyrian steel. Lady Ryder of the Rising Hills. Lady Mora of House Stark, Archmistress of Apothecaries and Woods Witch. Her castle features weirwood doors with painted moons. The King's Justice, Sir Troy the Steady, wielder of the Valyrian steel blade Fate. The Queen's High Council, Rebea Star Eyes, Lady of the Waves and Mistress of Ships, Captain of the Iron Shadow Cat. In the shadows, we bear our claws. Grand Archmaester Rennie, whose rod and ring and mask are quartz crystal, wielder of the Valyrian steel pen, fire and ink. Lady Tracy the Ascendant, ruler of the Cloud Keep, master of laws. The Purple Lord, Leo Anansi, master of whispers. The King's Guard, Lord Commander Namian of House Darkland, the Night Slayer, Valyrian sword, Onyx Abyss. Sir Dean the White, Knight of the Black Star. Gregor Snow, called Snow Bear, a bastard of Winterfell. Vaughn of House Furster, Sigil is mailed fist with extended forefinger and pinky on light blue field. Visenya, let us hold Dark Sister once. Sir Bateman the Dark Knight. Sir Roland de Stark, gunslinger knight of the Winter Kings, back from a twenty year ranging to the lands of Always Winter to protect my King Aziz. The Queen's Guard, Lord Captain Commander Hema Helminth, the Sellsword Sentinel, Sir Rambo, Knight of House Ganon, First Blood. Amber the Adamant, Knight of the Mist, and Mother of Squids, the Wintry Wolverine, we finish what you begin. 
nor an eco, Archmaester Vena, whose ring, rod, and mask are made of steel, not pudding. And the Beard Guard, Lord Commander George the Golden, Lady Rita of the Coppermane, the Unbound, Dance the Fervor. Sir Jeff, Warden of the AC, Wielder of Triad, the Multifaceted Beard of Platinum, Red and Brown, Stay Frosty. Lord Commander Richard the Ligerheart, Wielder of Barry's Ankle Breaker, a flail with blue and silver Valyrian steel spikes. Motto, Go Blue. First Builder, Magor Snow, also known as Magor the Cool, the Fire in the Snow. First Ranger Liam, also known as Sir Waiting on a Nickname, and First Steward Sir Jurian of the Torrentine, called Palewind. We'll see you all soon with new episodes of Radio Westeros and History of Westeros. Thanks again for joining us. Valar Reredus. Bye for now. <laughs>